grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. If you would open your Bibles, please, to Psalm 104. Psalm 104 is a praise psalm. In classic theology, we say that we praise God for what He has done. We worship God for who He is. And this is a psalm that praises God for what He has done. It has been called a splendid praise psalm. It has been called the finest praise psalm in the Bible. It has been called the most perfect hymn the world has ever produced. The psalm in praising God follows the events of creation of days 1 through 6 that are found in Genesis. It's not exact, but it does seem to be in order. But got to remember that it is poetry. One commentator said Psalm 104 is a poetic reflection on the creation story in Genesis. The Bible says that God rejoices in His creation. It also says that God's creation rejoices in Him. And so for us to reflect on creation and what God did, you'll get a headache if you try to figure out how God did it. But figuring out what God did, you can read through Genesis, you can read through this psalm and just be amazed at God's creation and creative ability. John Piper wrote in his book, The Pleasures of God, which if you have never read The Pleasures of God, I would recommend it. He went through the Bible, and every time it says that God is pleased by something, he wrote that in his book, and it is a biblical list of things that please God. If you've ever wondered, what pleases God? Well, there's a book called The Pleasures of God, and in that book it says, Creation pleases God, and it pleases God because it glorifies Him in so many profound ways. The fact that there was nothing, and then God created all of this is something that we just stand and we are amazed at, and that glorifies God. And so this psalm, goes through the days of creation. It talks about light in verse 2, which is day 1. It talks about the firmament dividing the waters in verse 2, which is day 2. It talks about the land and water distinct from one another in Psalm 104, 5 through 9, and 10 through 13. And vegetation and trees, which is Psalm 104, 14 through 17 which is day three. Day four, you have light in the sky and the seasons in verses 19 and 23. You have creatures of sea and air in verses 25 and 26, which is day five. And you have animals and man and food for all creatures, which is day six. And so we see that God's creation glorifies God. It starts by saying, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers messengers winds his... He makes his messengers winds, his ministers a flaming fire. So God standing above creation can stand on creation as it were. He is not part of creation. If you look at the the religions of the ancient world and even some today, there, there would be a storm a mighty storm, and the people would reason that there must be a god of storms. There would be a flood from the river or the lake, and then they would assume from that or believe in that that there must be a a god in the lake who is angry at them in some way. And so these religions that are called animist religions, you would worship nature because God was part of nature, because God was in nature somehow. And if I 
made God angry because of my actions, the punishment would be a storm or a flood or a fire or something as that because God was part of creation. The idea that creation emanated out of God or became part of God is what many of the ancient false religions believed. And there's a bit of Hinduism that believes that today, a bit of Buddhism that believes that today, that God is actually in the tree and God is in the lake and God is in these things or part of these things. That is something that is directly against the Bible. God is not part of creation. Creation did not come out of his essence or out of his being. God being in nothingness, in infinite spiritual whatever that we don't even know in eternity, decided to create matter for the first time. And in doing that, it's over there. God's over here. It's over there. God is not part of his creation as creation is damaged by sin, which is what we did, then that does not negate or weaken God in some way. Uh, C.S. Lewis says, it is surely just because the natural objects are no longer taken to be themselves divine that they can now be magnificent symbols of divinity. By emptying nature of divinity, or let us say of divinities, you may fill her with deity, for she is now the bearer of messages. And what this means is we can now look at creation and praise God. We can praise God for being creative, for, for making these things, for making a tree. I can't make a tree. Scientists have tried. They cannot make a tree. God can just make a tree. God can make all these things. We travel around and we see the mountains and the lakes and we see all the amazing things that God has made. God made all these things and we can praise Him for that. We can stand in awe of His creation, knowing that His creation isn't Him, but it points to Him. It cries out that there's a Creator. It tells us just by looking at nature that somebody made it, that somebody created it, that it didn't just happen as your, your random evolutionists would say today. And so Psalm 104 walks through the, the praising God for various things that he did in creation. In verses 5 through 9, he separated the land from the water. The, as Jewish people were reading this, in a Jewish person's mind, they were land people. God gave them a promised land. Nowhere in history or in the Bible did the Jewish people make a boat and go exploring. That is not what the Jewish people are. They are land-based people. And so it is, a, it is a blessing as they read through creation that the world was not just covered in water and given to us to figure out that God actually created dry land to poke its way out of the water and he gave that to the people. He gave that to the Jewish people. In Scripture, we see that the only boats that the Jewish people ever made were to go fishing. And so they didn't go anywhere. They didn't travel from here to there. If you wanted to move, you didn't make a boat and go across Galilee or the Mediterranean. You went around it because they were land-based people. And so as God made land on earth and gave it, that is something that a Jewish person reading this would understand as very important to their heart, important to their people. We as traveling people, although not today, we as traveling people do not see water as an obstacle. We don't see land as an obstacle. We can get on a plane and go to Singapore. We can go to Japan. We can go to Turkey. We can go way over there, anywhere in the world, and we don't see anything as an obstacle. And so we may not grab the, the importance of God creating land because you and I are also land-based people. It is the rare person 
who will live on a boat. You can go to Santa Cruz or the San Leandro Marina and find a handful of them. I've actually worked with people who one guy lived on a boat in Santa Cruz. Uh, but that is not normal. We all don't live on boats. We all live on land and we go and we build a house on land. And when Jesus is talking about what the proper life is, he said, you build your house on rock, which is land, instead of on sand. Because when the storm comes, like the coronavirus, if you are building on sand, you will begin to doubt God and begin to curse God even, as some have done, because the world isn't turning out the way they wanted. The second thing is, that God produced food and water for God's creatures. He didn't just put a rock badger out there and say, figure it out. According to this and according to other places in scriptures, it says in, in 18, for example, the high mountains are for the wild goats. The rocks are a refuge for the rock badger, that God has a plan that God put together and built rocky areas and then put the, the, the rams that live up there and the rock badgers that live up there, put them there as a place to live. And then if you've ever watched any nature shows, they have these little crevices which collect water and these little crevices which vegetation pops out, and that's what these animals eat. And you could say, man, boy, are they lucky you know, that something's growing up there. Or you could say it's part of God's ecosystem, that God put it together, that's part of God's design, that they're going to eat the little vegetation that grows through the rocks and others are going to eat, uh, you know, wheat and land and grasses and stuff, that people, that animals that live down here, uh, the birds have their nest, the stork has their home in the trees, that God has invented trees for birds to live in. It isn't just a fantastic lucky thing that they figured it out. No, God put it in the minds of the birds that they're supposed to live up there on trees or as we build tall buildings, live in the tops of the tall buildings. That That is what is in the mind of the birds. That is what is in the mind of the mountain goats. That is what is in the mind of the, the animals in the sea, that is all these things are designed and put together and God has built it that way. And if you look at any details of how the world works together and how the whole system of food and water and reproduction and where animals live and what they're supplied for there, you, you are amazed. You could just say, wow, you know, Mother Nature is really clever. Or you could say, wow, God really thought this through. He really put together a system that works fantastically. And that truthfully, no matter how much we try, we're not going to break it. God's system is better than us, is bigger than us. And so if we look at it, we just stand back in awe that God, God's amazing. God put this all, wow, he put this all together and he put it all together for us. He put it all together for Adam and Eve. He said, this is for you. They messed it up, but it continues. It's for us, okay? We are to look at it. We are to think of God. We are to be amazed and we are to worship It says in 15, the wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. In the Old Testament, if you were to line up three staples that every family had, it would be wine, wine mostly because it makes you happy, but secondly, because the water in a lot of these places would kill you. If you read through the wandering in the wilderness, the, the, they drink the water and it's bitter and people actually died from drinking the water because a lot of water in the desert places aren't that good. But wine, because of the alcohol, kills all those little bacteria thingies and you can drink it and you can get 
nourishment, you can get hydration from it. And so that is that became in the Old Testament um, a gift from God as something that makes our life better. Second is oil to make your face shine. Uh, when in the book of Acts, when they're talking about medicine, when they talked about preparing Jesus for burial after he died, oil was in there. Oil was considered the number one medicine back in the day. Uh, I don't think they knew why. Today we have Band-Aids and stuff. But they would use oil, and they would use oil as a way to protect their skin from the heat of the sun, that oil was necessary to keep your body functioning in hot desert areas. And then third, God gave us bread to strengthen man's heart. Uh, bread is a euphemism for all kinds of food. Uh, God provided food for us. Uh, many of us will figure out what to have for lunch when we leave here today. We have to understand that that ability to find food that won't kill us, to find food that nourishes us, to find food that is good tasting, and to give us skill to prepare it, or other places with skilled chefs to prepare it, and you go get it. The idea that we have food, the fact that we are sustained, the fact that we can continue and even live into our 70s is an amazing thing because as people, I've, I've listened to evolutionary scientists here and there, and one thing that, that stood out, and Jordan P Peterson picks up on this, is that nature's number one job is to kill you. Nature does not want you out there. You have spiders in your house as people are not using these, these large arenas. Wild animals are now moving in. That the, the idea that this is a welcoming place for us isn't necessarily true, but God gives us the skill to tame it, to have dominion over it and to work in it so that we have a, a safe place. If you were just picked up and put in the middle of the desert, you would understand how nature is trying to kill you. But the idea that we can, from the Bible, from what God told the Jewish people, we can make a life. We can tame nature. We can actually live and praise God. Verses 19 through 23, God put lights in the sky. We call them the sun and the moon, and they are regular. And people who have looked at them all the way back to, you know, probably Adam and Eve and Noah, they noticed, hey, the same time every morning the sun comes up and goes down. And if they were to count off the hours uh, in Jesus' time, they talked about the third hour, the fourth hour, the fifth hour. They're counting off the hours. And it's the same all the time. God has regulated time. And back in, the, back in the day, if you were walking down the street and you didn't have a watch and you saw somebody who did, you could ask them what time it is and they would look at their Timex and they would tell you what time it is. And then if you ask the next person what time it is, it would be the same time because time is regulated. Now we have phones and computers and all sorts of things. We have big old clock towers that bong on the hours, and it, it is the same and has been for thousands of years that God has created regulated time. We have put names like minutes and seconds and hours on this regulated time. The only time that God invented was the day, uh, and the moon goes around every month, the sun goes around every day, and so the idea that God has created a regulated system, we can actually plan and we can actually live in it. If one day was three hours long, and the next one was 30, and the next one was 18, it would be a rough, you know, how would you make your work schedule? I'm sure we'd work it out, but random time 
would mess up the human mind. We like regulated things, and I think that's a gift of creation, is that we have, give or take, 24-hour days, give or take 30-day months. And then God, with the Jewish people at Sinai, invented the seven-day week. Uh, The seven-day week is not found anywhere in nature. Nature does not point to a seven-day week at all. That was given by God at Sinai, where he said, you work for six, you rest one, then you start all over. And the week was invented. And because of the Jewish people, we got Saturday off. And because of the Christians, we now get Sunday off, because that is Resurrection Day. So you can you can thank the two-day weekend, as opposed to the one-day weekend, the two-day weekend, to God's working with people and to people responding with to God. The, the regulation of time is something that is, I don't think people ponder it enough about what a great gift that was. They just curse it when daylight savings comes and they you know, don't understand how that works. But the idea that, you know, what are you doing tomorrow? Well, I, I have a good chance, you know, If Jesus Christ does not come back, we can plan for tomorrow. And we know that we have so many hours of daylight, and I can actually look it up in my farmer's almanac and know exactly how many hours of daylight there will be tomorrow. Because last year at that time, and the year before, and the year for as long as the farmer's almanac has been writing it down, we know how long the days are, and we know they shrink until you hit December 21st, and then they grow until you hit January, uh, June 21st. And anywhere in the world, you know how many hours of daylight you have, and I think that is a gift. Then when it gets to the end, starting in verse 24, O Lord, how manifold all your works, and wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures, God rejoices in the diversity, in the greatness, in the the numbers of different things. God rejoices in His creation. God looks at it, and it says in Genesis, He said it was good. I think God is very pleased with what He has made. Scripture seems to be uh, of that idea that God did not look at it and say, man, what a mistake, you know, and spun us off into the universe to die. No, he likes what he made, and he loves us, and so that is something when God looks at creation, even with us in it, he looks at creation and he says, this is a good thing, this pleases him. One commentator wrote, this is a picture that is drawn on so vast a scale that one scarcely knows whether one should be more amazed at the prolific imagination of the writer or at the abounding gifts of God. You read through Scripture at what God has created, and it's amazing. And it says in verse 30, when you send forth your spirit, no, 29, when you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die to return to dust. We know that all of this is maintained by God, that every breath I take is a gift of God, that every breath I take is part of God's will and God's plan for my life. And when that time comes and He takes it away, I will die, people will die, animals will die, fish will die, birds will die. When God says it is time for their breath to leave them. Then he says, when you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. Every life that is on this planet is a creation of God. There are no accidents. Evolution is a lie. It is an unprovable lie t- meant to push God out of our schools. God is the creator of all. Star- starts in 31, may the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in His works, who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing of the Lord as long as I live. I will praise, I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditations 
be pleasing to Him, for I rejoice in the Lord. If you look in the book of Job, in 38, when God is explaining to Job how little he knows, God says, were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Or what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? And one commentator says, prior to creation, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all alone in eternity. It is just them. They are spirit. Christ, before the incarnation, was spirit. He became incarnate. He now has a body, but in eternity past, He did not. He was spirit. So all that existed anywhere was spirit. Then God creates some angels. God creates some heavenly beings to be with Him. And they are spirit. And so you have only spirit in existence. Spirit you can't touch. Spirit you can't see unless they want you to. Spirit that can go anywhere, be anywhere. Spirit. And then God, boom, for the first time ever, makes something physical something made out of matter, something that has never existed before, even as a concept. He makes a physical universe that you can touch, that you can see, that can't move around really fast. It is a physical thing that we live in. And John Piper writes in The Pleasures of God that this must have blown away the angels so much to just see this spiritual existence become physical instantly. All the stars, all the galaxies, all the nebula, and us, all brought into existence instantly, and it must have blown them away. God, of course, knows what He's doing, and I think we need to maintain the idea of being blown away at what God has done. We need to be able to look at it and not criticize it, not say, I'd like it to be different, but to say, wow, you know, the houses that we live in is part of God's creation. He gave the skill to the builders. He gave the ideas to the builders of what to build and how to build. He gave the ideas to you on what you wanted to build, things of this nature. It is God working through creation, and we need to stop and be blown away a bit by what God has done and what God has made. And sure, when things get back to normal, you're going to have traffic again, and we're going to hate the traffic, but we could say, wow, God put in the mind of people to build these cars and to pave these roads and all the variety of vehicles and all the variety of people that are out there is something that we can praise God for, that God is a creative God and He has created a manifold, an uncountable number of variations that we need to look at and praise Him for it. The psalm ends in 35, Let sinners be compute, let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. And you may say, well, that's no, that, that doesn't fit. That isn't in Genesis. What is that doing there? Well, if the person who wrote this is pondering God's perfect creation, the thing that broke it is sinners. The thing that broke it is wicked people. And if God is going to return earth to its perfect, sinless way, as He will in the book of Revelation, God will at some point have to remove sin from the earth, remove sin from heaven, and that will be the great divide at the end of time is those people who today are shaking their fist at God and saying, you are not my creator. 
I did this all myself, those people will be separated from God forever. And those who humble themselves and come to God and praise Him because of His creation, we will spend eternity on the streets of gold in the new heaven and the new earth. All of creation was built to glorify God, and we need to look at the stories in the Bible, take them as true, look outside at the variety. Just when you go out into the parking lot today, look at the varieties of plants that are around the creek. I mean, that is amazing. It is God is glorified by the variety, by the difference. God is glorified by all that He has made, even you and I, even the people. There are those today that say that people are the real virus. That is not true. We are put here to enjoy creation. We are put here to look at a tree and not worship it. We look at a tree and worship the God who created that tree. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I thank you for creation. I thank you for this day. I thank you for all that you have done. And that in doing it, I pray that you would focus our minds and our hearts on you and on your glory. I pray that during this time of difficulty that we are living in, the people will not shake their fist at you, but they may see it as a time, as an opportunity to actually come to you in all humility and to stand before you and praise you for all that you have done for us, for you keep us, you feed us, you keep us safe, you keep an atmosphere on this planet so that we can breathe. And Lord, through all of that, we just thank you. You are truly our creator and our savior. And we ask all this through the blood of Christ. Amen.